Hello and welcome to Mindset. My name is Chantelle Fitzgerald and your host. And as you know, we talk to industry leaders at the top of their field to learn how did they get there, their challenges and struggles along the way, and their mindset to push through. And we have an incredible guest for you today. Her name is Dr. Colleen Georges. She is an internationally known speaker, trainer, coach, author and actually the author of this incredible book which is called Rescript the story you're telling yourself so I am so excited to talk to her she is a doctor in psychology and can't wait to learn more about um, her journey so thank you so thank much you for being so much here for having me Chantal. yes I'm looking forward to digging into your story your sure, background yeah. how you wrote this amazing book so tell us what was was it that got you so interested in psychology to go on and get a doctorate in it? Yeah, you know, I, I think I started contemplating that in high school. Um, and originally, I was kind of going between, did I want to major maybe in English when I went to college, or did I want to major in psychology? So I was taking a creative writing course and a psych course. I think it was my junior year of high school when you're starting to think about that stuff. And um, I ultimately landed on psychology because I could probably do both. I thought I could, you know, I could counsel people and I could potentially write a book as well at some point. And, um, and that was what I chose to do. And I think the thing that's so funny too is that once I got to college, um, ironically, I loved, I liked the sociology classes better than I liked the psychology oh, classes. Oh, wow. So I had like, you know, many people do. I think there's those little crises of like, what do I want to do? Yes. But, um, but I, I knew I liked the helping professions. Mm -hmm. And I had done, you know, when I was in high school, um, the, the jobs that I had, I was like a camp counselor. And so it was just like sort of a natural, I think, sort of progression to go in that direction. I really, I liked, I liked just anything to do with sort of mentoring. Mm -hmm. you know people so mm -hmm. I love it wow yeah. and it's so cool that you knew that or that had that interest in high school yeah and and that was something that was a passion of yours from the very beginning being so young because oftentimes as adults we're still trying to figure yeah. it out yeah. and you really had this passion from early on in high school and knew that that's what you wanted to do and also helping people yeah. was something that was really important to you yeah so tell us a little bit more so you um, had this passion that started in high school yeah. and uh, you ended up going to college and majoring it and, and then and, and in college you knew you wanted to get your doctorate as well. Yeah, um, or I should say my parents knew I was going to get a doctor. Oh. <laughs> that's really more, that's oh, a more nice. accurate yes. way of putting it. Oh, wow. Um, yes. You know, both my parents really, pu you know, really pushed education. Mm -hmm. And um, and and they were um, they were non-traditional students, both of them. My, my dad went to uh, Middlesex County College when I was a baby, and my mom went when I was a teenager, and they both ended up getting their bachelor's degrees. But um, so education wasn't something that necessarily was happening, you know, um, generations prior, mm -hmm. but they were all about like you'll go to you'll go yes. to school. This is going to help you, and y you know you should get your doctorate. Mm -hmm. So um, I got real scared. I will admit, though, um, I I said you know let me apply for a master's degree first. So I applied for a master's in counseling, and at that point when I was in college, um, I. I was thinking at that point about um, early on about maybe working with a psychiatric population, a psychiatric hospital, or potentially um, I thought about being a prison psychologist. Mm. And I did an externship that kind of led me in a different direction. Um, I also was working in South Jersey. I'm from Central Jersey, but I was working in South Jersey with um, teenagers in foster care. Mm. And, um, and basically I was like a recreational counselor. It really what that meant was being a mentor and um, I it was it truly will always be one of the best things I ever did mm. and that kind of led me to think well maybe I'd like to work with teens and families but then the serendipitous experience in graduate school was during my master's program my advisor let me know about an opportunity to work with college students at the career services office and that's what kind of changed the tr career trajectory for me Wow! but I did decide while I was doing my master's that um, we had a doctoral program in the same school 
And I kind of, even without my parents knowing, I just applied, I didn't tell anybody. I told them when I got the interview. Oh, <laughs> so. nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And then, and then what after, you know, after having that experience in training college students yeah. and um, supporting them, after you ended up going through your doctorate, what at what point did you decide did you, did you decide to start your own business? And yeah. also, at what point did you know you wanted to write, or yeah. you decided to write this particular yeah. book, rescript your story that you're telling yourself? The um, I worked in higher ed for the time I was in grad school part time, and then once I graduated, I had um, from like 2003 to 2010, I worked full time in higher education at Rutgers. I worked with um, first generation low income students mm. um, through the EOF and the TRIO programs. And what's EOF for those? EOF is the Educational Opportunity Fund program, and that's a state-based program for low-income first-gen students, and the TRIO programs are the federally funded uh, version of those programs. Mm. And I mean, I'll always say my EOF and my TRIO students are the best students ever. Um, I love them, and I, I love my seven years working with my students. Um, what changed everything was I, had this w weird hobby writing resumes that I had developed when I was an intern at Career Services in graduate school. Mm. I just, it was, it was my hobby. I wrote it for friends, family, everybody needs one. Mm -hmm. And so once people found out that I did this as a hobby, everybody starts asking. Oh. So it was just, you know, I didn't charge people. I mm -hmm. just, I liked it. Mm -hmm. So um, at some point, somebody said to me, it was probably in about 2007, 2008, someone said, why don't you start a business? And I thought, writing resumes, right? So that's how it all began. It started as a part-time resume writing business while I was working full-time. And then my son was born in 2009. I went back to work after a few months of maternity leave and I wasn't happy. Mm. And that's what changed everything. So mm. honestly, becoming a parent is what changed everything. Wow. I decided at that point that I wanted more time with him and I wanted more flexibility. And the way that I could get that would be, and I also teach at Rutgers, I thought, what if I taught some classes and I tried to make this business a full-time thing? Mm -hmm. And then the career coaching and the life coaching, it all kind of evolved, the speaking opportunities to write in anthologies, all these things evolved when I walked away from my full-time job in 2010 and decided to do my own thing. Wow, that yeah. is amazing. And that takes a lot of courage to do that. Oh yeah. As well. <laughs> you know, it's not easy to walk no. away from a full-time job, a full-time paycheck no. that comes in regularly and the benefits that are associated with, especially yeah. working in higher ed. Yeah. So that really took a lot of courage to jump out on your yeah. own into the unknown. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. And what was your mindset at the time <laughs> to even do that? Yeah, I, you know, I was scared like anybody but would be scared. And I, it was like what I thought was kind of a crazy idea that came into my head. You know, I'm not happy and I want to be with my son more. And, you know, what if? And I pretty quickly went to my husband and pitch the idea thinking, and he's he's a great supportive person, but I still thought that he'd mm -hmm. be like, uh, no, that's not a good idea. And um, he was like, let's do it. And, and that was it. I think, you know, having him be so supportive, not question me, not, he, he was less worried than I was mm. and that he had faith that I was going to make this work mm -hmm. and um, that was fuel so I think for me at that point it was plan plan my way out mm. and I spent six months planning my way out and I thought the worst going from mindset you know because uh, as I you know, when we talk a little bit about the book, I am a, a recovering catastrophizer, as I call myself, so I can turn something um, either ambiguous or only a little bit bad into something awful real quick in mm -hmm. my mind. Mm -hmm. So I really had to say, the worst thing that can happen here is that it fails and that it's not making money and I, and okay, and then what will I do? Then I will, you know, apply for positions in higher ed. And if I have to start back a little bit, I will. We'll be okay. Mm -hmm. I had to be able to say, we'll be okay. We're smart. You know, we're, we're in a good situation. I've got a support system here. 
and we'll figure it out mm -hmm. instead of turning it into some big catastrophe. And it ended up, all of the what ifs and the they, they never happened. Mm. They never happened. Mm. That's amazing because it, our brains can be so powerful. Oh God! <laughs> and, and they can always give us the worst case scenario, yeah. and then they become reality, and you feel like, <laughs> oh my gosh, this is the end of the world. When yeah. actually, it's not. Yeah. So, what was the catalyst to write, rescript the story you're telling yourself? Yeah. Because I feel like that in that moment, you know, the what ifs, the scary oh things, God. and yet it never even happened. It's just our yeah. minds coming up with all of these um, extra thoughts that aren't yeah. helpful. You know, I saw so many people that I was working with that were, um, again, doing the same things that I did to myself. You know, I had panic attacks in graduate school. I had dealt with anxiety um, and, you know, was always really like my worst enemy. And it took, it took me changing the way that I talked to myself and reframing the whole discussion that I had internally. Um, and really doing that intentionally all day long, like that it's not a thing that you learn it and it's like, you know, it's not 21 days to something and then you're good, right? It's you will for the rest of your life need to have a different conversation with that antagonistic voice that talks to you. You're gonna have to respond differently to it and you have to be aware of it to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I experienced it. I saw my students were going through it that I, you know, and when I was advising, when I'm teaching, and clients were doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I and I felt like I've always wanted to write this book, and maybe this is a way for me to sort of get this out there to an audience, some folks who don't know me, who aren't going to contact me for coaching, but maybe it gets out there to a bigger audience of people who need this, like like I needed it, mm -hmm. and that was that was it. I love it. We have to take a break, but I want to come back to dig a little bit deeper into the book right. and also your coaching and your business and how you have really blossomed over the last almost decade, yeah. really, of owning your own business. Yeah. So um, we will be right back with Dr. Colleen Georges in just a few minutes to learn more. See you soon. <laughs> Shelter dogs aren't broken. They've simply experienced more life. If they were human, we would call them wise. They would be the ones with tales to tell and stories to write. The ones dealt a bad hand who responded with courage. Do not pity a shelter dog. Adopt one. Say we've got grit, and we'll take it as a compliment. Because it's our uncommon drive, our spark within, that brings us together and sets us apart. We are temple made. And when others take shortcuts, when others take breaks, when others take the easy way, we take charge. Add us on social media watch bloopers, behind-the-scenes footage, previews, and more. I work 13 hours a day, six days a week, so when I'm off the clock, I gotta get stuff done. So when I need a snack, I need something healthy, tasty, and easy to eat. Like wonderful pistachios without the shells. They're protein powered, delicious, and great on the go. And that's perfect for me. Thanks, Liz. A woman without a lot of time. Whether you're a gourmet cook or just want to eat like one, visit Rostelli Market Fresh, your home for the freshest locally sourced ingredients to please everyone who loves great food. Our organic meats, quality seafood, and free-range poultry are cut fresh to order. Chefs create culinary-inspired prep foods made fresh every day, which pair nicely with our vast selection of fine wines and spirits. Choose from handmade pastas, artisan cheeses, organic produce, and grocery items, all from the finest purveyors. Rostelli Market Fresh, from our family to yours. RVN TV is a platform for. So I don't know. 
Hello and welcome back to Mindset. We are here with Dr. Colleen Georges talking about her incredible journey of becoming a psychologist, but also an international best-selling author of Rescript, The Story You're Telling Yourself as well as being a coach and owning her own business. And we were just talking about how you got the idea to write this book because you were also seeing so many yeah. people around you who were also telling themselves negative thoughts and or telling themselves negative stories yeah. about themselves um, from your families to your colleagues and coworkers, just to everyone around you. And so you had this idea of, huh, let me see how I can serve people and also people that may not even know who I am. Yeah, how yeah. can I best serve them? So tell us a little bit more about the book and also what can people expect and learn from it? Sure. So the book, you know, I think the book was such a long-standing thing that I'd wanted to do. I mean, I first got the thought of writing a book in high school, but I, it, it, it wasn't something that really kind of stuck in my head, but it it would resurface and um, after I finished my doctorate I started writing a book which was the worst time to start writing a book if there's ever a worse time after writing a dissertation was probably it I got tired very quickly I let it go and I dropped it for about a decade and then I would go back at it for dribs and drabs 2015 I'd start stop 16 17 and it was finally in 2018 that I really did the bulk of the writing um, I put myself on a schedule I learned that phrases like I just said before the worst time are actually really awful things that we can say to ourselves too there's not a good time or a bad time really um, it's really what you say to yourself and it's how you structure it for yourself mm -hmm. um, because you know a lot of things like writing a book or you know little the, the passions that we have you know when you're you've got family you've got a job you've got all these other responsibilities and deadlines there's not time coming you know and I think we we'll say things like oh maybe next year will be better or maybe next week or maybe ne you know you've got to figure out how you're going to make it work. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so you know, in terms of like the desire was really like there, I saw that people needed it and that I wasn't the only one going through this. This seemed to be a pretty predominant challenge for people. Um, and so I, I really did the bulk of the writing in 2018 and, um, and really wanted to talk about self-talk. You know, really wanted to also talk about, you know, how do we, when we have goals for ourselves, how do we, you know, both from a mental perspective and an action perspective, um, be proactive and optimistic and hopeful and supporting of ourselves instead of shutting ourselves down or creating, mm -hmm. creating, you know, goals that are just absolutely unreasonable how do we make unoverwhelm ourselves so that we can really achieve the things we want to achieve yeah yeah what tips do you have for those things when we are being down or maybe we do yeah. have a goal that's like so daunting and yes I feel like even writing a book can be yeah. a very daunting task yeah. like oh my gosh <laughs> yeah. like that's a huge like this is a lot of work there's a lot of words yes. in there yeah yes and it's, it's <laughs> not and it's not short either no. like this <laughs> this is incredible. You know, this takes dedication and time and the mindset to push through yeah. um, doing something like that. So what maybe one or two tips do you have for yeah. people that want to set goals of either writing a book or even just any goal yeah. um, that they want to overcome? Maybe losing weight, yeah. maybe eating better, having better sleeping habits, whatever the case may be. Yeah, I mean, I think the, depending on the goal, there's always different things we can do, but you you know, most importantly, one, it's it's deciding that the things that you want to do are as important as the things you need to do. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's the key, like the first key, mm -hmm. um, because I feel like we put the wants last. Mm -hmm. They're the things that never get crossed off the list because they're not there. There's no deadline associated with them. Um, there's no urgency. There's no one who's not going to pay you because you don't do it. There's no one you're going to let down other than yourself. So all those goals we have for ourselves, no matter what they are, um, we're the only ones that really suffer typically if we don't do that thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to decide that your wants and you are just as important as the responsibilities that you have in your life to other people. What's the difference between a want and a need? A need is a have to. 
I got to, you know, and, and you may want to do some of the things that you need to do. Mm -hmm. They're not always, you know, mutually exclusive. But, you know, there's, there's some, something associated with them that it's required of you for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, wants are, I desire to do this, but maybe there is no urgency associated with it or no, nothing, nothing awful will happen, nothing catastrophic will happen if I don't do this thing, aside from the fact that I'm going to be upset with myself, that I know that this is something that's meaningful to me and I'm not acting on it. Mm -hmm. But that's enough. And I think that I find that with myself, with this book, that that was something that was always gnawing at me. Um, you know, knowing I wanted to do this, but I was not creating time for it. I was deeming it less important than everything else. And I see people do that with their weight and with their getting, a, a, you know, out of a career that they don't love or that's making them miserable or a relationship that they're unhappy in. Whatever it is, right, there's so many things. Saving money, you know. We can keep kind of living all right mm -hmm. and things aren't, maybe they're not bad, mm -hmm. but is it about just being all right or is it about being happy and thriving? Yes. Yeah, I love that. And you coach people on yeah. just that exact thing, on how to thrive. And yeah. I've been on your website, read the testimonials, and you have really transformed people's lives. Thank you. Um, and really taking them from being in that career that they hated or just, just was not a good fit and really coaching them to finding a place that's a better fit yeah. where they are thriving. So tell us about your coaching practice and tell us how... Um, you take your clients through the journey of transformation. Yeah, you know, and it's one of the things I love about what I do is like nobody's situation is the same, right? It's, it's you know, with my one on one clients, everybody's story is different, where they're coming from, what it is they want to do. Um, but I do find that a lot of folks come to me about, you know, at least career is in the mix. Mm -hmm. um, although I have had some clients where they were like, no, career is great. I want to work on other stuff. Yeah. Um, but career is usually in the mix. Um, but it's, you know, again, sometimes it is those other types of goals for our health or our self-care or, you know, um, doing more things that are fun and enjoyable, um, planning for the future. Um, you know, relationship related goals, but just um, first it's finding out, like I like to just assess, well, how satisfied are you with each area of your life? Mm -hmm. you know, let's, let's, if we were to put it on a scale from one to 10, really simple stuff. Um, and I say there's like, you know, kind of 10 areas of life. How satisfied are you in a scale from one to 10? And then um, talking with people about what made you give it this number? Mm -hmm. um, like what, what makes this a nine? Mm -hmm. um, because maybe we have something to learn there. Mm -hmm. You know, what are, what are you doing in this area of your life that maybe you're not doing in another area mm -hmm. of your life that you rated as a two or a three or a one? Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes, it's the, the very obvious, it's that we're, in, we're investing something. Mm -hmm. We're investing either time or money or some type of resource into the areas that we're doing better in and that we feel better about. Um, so assessing, and then oftentimes I'll ask a question of, you know, as a homework assignment, initial homework assignment, look at each of these areas of your life and just say, it, what's one simple thing, really pretty easy, accessible thing I could do to maybe take it up one notch from a six to a seven or a two to a three? What's one little thing I could do? Something that's not too difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, because we need to experience success oftentimes before we feel like we can be successful. Mm -hmm. So let's do some little things. And then when you say, wow, I was able to do that. I invested time and energy and I made myself important. Maybe I could take this a step further. Mm -hmm. So that's one piece of it. And I think, it, you know, aside from that, it's really getting an understanding of how you look at, you know, how you help a person look at their life and say, where are the spaces where I have, you know, um, I say, you know, where my time's getting stolen, right? Maybe it's doing things that you don't have to do. Maybe you're giving your time too much to other people and you could take some of it back for yourself. Mm -hmm. You're prioritizing everybody else but you. Um, or maybe it's social media, um, you know, and, and spending a little bit less time doing that. But where is time getting stolen from you? And if you took some of it back, could you have some that you could dedicate to what, 
you want to work on. And then when do you think the best? Are you someone who's good in the morning, before work? Are you, or maybe it's for exercising, if it's not a thinking activity, um, or the afternoon, or later in the day, what motivates you? How can you reward yourself for the things that, the little steps and strides you make towards your goals? Um, and savor your successes. It's not just about the big end goal, right? It's about mm -hmm. all the little things we do, all the little tiny changes we make in our lives to get there mm -hmm. um, that maybe don't seem that big of a deal, but are a really big deal. Mm -hmm. So helping people celebrate those, those little movements, you know, towards the goal. Um, and simultaneously, when that voice tells you, that you're not doing it fast enough, or it's not good enough, or you missed a day of exercise, or you missed a day of working on your book, or you didn't search for jobs today, or you, whatever it is, that, that you say, no, we're not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. I, I did X, mm -hmm. and that was awesome, and it's okay that today, I was a little off today, because I could start right back right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and saying kinder things to yourself. Right. Yes, I love that. And I love what you're talking about how when you work with your clients, you really take an assessment of where are they right now. Yeah. And I love that assessment to see where they are and then identify areas where they can improve. And I also love what you said about just a little tiny yeah. thing. What's the little tiny thing that you can do today that doesn't seem overwhelming that you can just move the needle on a little bit more. Right. I love that because I feel like the, the more baby steps we have, the yeah. bigger impact we're making in the long run. Mm -hmm. And just doing a tiny baby step can be helpful to feel successful that you actually did that. And then not beating yourself up on the fact that, um, you know, maybe you missed a day right. or you missed doing something and, and really speaking to yourself from a more kinder perspective as opposed to, oh, I can't do this. I missed a day. Forget it. I'm done. I'm right. out. You know, right. then that's like, whoa, that's so harsh. Yeah. You know, instead of saying, oh, I missed a day. You know right. what? It's okay. I'm going to pick it up tomorrow or right. I'm going to try it tonight, you know, or, or whatever the case yeah. may be. Amazing. So before we go, we have to wrap up. Um, they're giving me the signal yeah. here. <laughs> but before we go, I wanted to ask you um, one last, well, two questions. One is, what are you most proud of in the decade that you have been um, running your own business, coaching, writing the book, um, and really impacting the world? Wow. I know, that's a big question. Um, cause you've done so many amazing things and continue to do amazing things. I think the thing I'm most proud of is learning how to do things afraid. Mm. I mean, if I could really kind of just sum it up, mm -hmm. um, because I feel like that's the thing that stops us is that because I'm scared, I should wait until I'm not scared. It's not happening. You just have to do it scared, yes. right? You, and and so I think because that's given me, and that's the second piece of it. Um, I'm proud of what it doing that has given me. It's given me um, the ability to drive my son to school every day and pick him up and and take him to his activities and have deep conversations with him and spend time with my husband and my son. Lots of time. Um, you know, um, to be able to do work I'm passionate about and, and help other people achieve their goals and help my, my college students um, who are, you know, if they're feeling uh, scared that they can't accomplish the things they want to accomplish to have kinder conversations with themselves. I mean, learning how to do things while afraid um, and learning how to have a conversation with myself about, you know, in the end, we make things so much bigger than they have to be. Even big things we make bigger. It doesn't mean that they're not big, but we can even make them worse, more catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And then things that maybe are nothing or they're small, we can blow them up and make them even scarier. And I think it's, I'm proud of taking, you know, I was a person with panic attacks and anxiety and now I don't have that. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud of that because That's it's allowed huge. me to do things that I can impact other people. 
that's huge and I and I love that and I love how you even though you were afraid you did it anyway mm -hmm. and stepping outside of your comfort zone and yeah. getting into uncomfortable territory um, which has allowed you to produce and create the business that you have yeah. the book that you've written and the co you know and the coaching that you do for um, to impact so many yeah. others which is really incredible thank you so much thank last you. part is how would people be able to get in touch with you sure. to learn more and to sign up um, to possibly be one of your um, coaches yeah yes. um, so my website is www.colleengeorges.com two L's two E's and an S at the end of George's <laughs> um, all my services are there there's a link to my book on my website and for anyone out there who is interested in a ch career shift or even career advancement or feeling just stuck in any area of life um, I'd love to have you reach out to me and or get a copy of the book Awesome. Thank you Thank so you, much Chantel. for being here. This was so <laughs> wonderful. I've really enjoyed getting to know you better, getting to know your story and um, your inspiration to step over fear and conquer, you know, and, and do the thing that you really want to do and don't let fear hold you back. Thank so you. you've been an incredible example of that. So thank you so much. And thank thanks you. to all of you for joining us here on Mindset. And we look forward to seeing you again soon on Mondays at 2 o'clock. See you soon.